Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Soul Focused Radio. This is your host, Martin Friedman, and I am so excited to be here with one of our facilitators, Stephanie Ashley. Hey, Stephanie. Good morning, Martin. How are you feeling today, Stephanie? I feel really good. I feel really glad to be here with you. I know. I'm really glad to be here with you too. Just transparently for our listeners, we have, we've tried this a couple of times, um, <laughs> technical difficulties and, you know, so I, I, I want folks to know that. And every time it feels like a new start too, though, you know what I mean? It feels totally. like a new opportunity for us to, you know, really share who you are with our Soul Focus Group audience. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So I, I really think about a lot of what we talk about with Soul Focus Group is who we are and what we are, right? And I think oftentimes we get bogged down in the what we are, and we don't spend enough time on the who we are. So I want to start with that. Who are you? Who is Stephanie Ashley? Sure. Well, so my my name is Stephanie Joy Ashley. A lot of people call me Steph Joy. And I'm going to say this for the for the first time, but I decided I was going to say it. I'm an artist and an activist and an advocate working on ending homelessness in San Francisco right now. And um, as you shared, I'm a, a relatively new trainer with Soul Focus Group. Yeah. So that is awesome. And I think that's part of who and part of what. What else would you, who else would you say you are? Like the essence of you, like you said, artist, like who, when you think of the essence of yourself, even before the what's, even before the activism and the, and the sure. facilitation and all that, who is Stephanie Joy? I love Steph Joy, by the way. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't tell you that yet, but, but I'm, I think I'm going to slowly start calling you Steph Joy and Steph Joy and see how it goes. Please do. I love the fact that every time I say your name, I can also say Joy. And then I could think about joy for myself too. Please do. You know, it's a nickname I got in high school and it's followed me throughout my life. And I usually don't introduce myself that way, but usually it eventually catches up to me. And I realized the other day I was like, I'm ready for the soul focus group to start calling me Steph Joy. So yeah, I don't know. I'm a, well, I'll just get the tough stuff out of the way first. I'm a Gemini, very controversial. Um, (laughs) I'm a bookworm. Mm. I'm a... I'm a queer woman. I'm a feminist. I'm a little bit of a weirdo and I'm really earnest (laughs) and I really like dad jokes. Yeah. I don't know. There's a little taste. (laughs) Nice. Nice. Really like dad jokes, huh? That's cool. I don't know if I, I'm trying to remember if I knew that about you or not, or if we talked about it in one of our many takes, I can't remember for sure. I'm pretty sure I've made some cringeworthy puns with you. Right. I I kind of think. Maybe you blocked them out of your memory. (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't have trauma around that. Joke. Okay. <laughs> I, actually have, I like them. I perpetuate them. And currently I live them. Okay. I'm, I'm a living dad joke in many ways. Awesome. In many ways. So, yeah. And so that's the who and the essence. And I really think of when you talk about Steph Joy, I think about how, you know, for those of our listeners that have heard a lot of the podcasts uh, where I've um, been talking to, uh, where I give them ID and I often identify myself as Teddy Bear Moses, you know, as much as Martin. And, you know, for me, that Steph joy is really what I'm feeling right now in terms of who you are, you know, that the joy is at your essence that, you know, and I think that that's, um, that's something that I, I think I've known about you. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, folks really wanted to ask you to be a part, you know, Dustin really wanted to ask you to be a part of what we're doing at Soul Focus Group because of even with all the other, you know, identities and all the things you, that you've talked about with us that you've been through in your life, you, you do hold joy. And that's that's challenging in this in this particular world to lead with joy. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, I think I resisted it for a period of my life. And Mm -hmm. I think what I've really come to realize in the last several years and um, and my partner has been a big, a big um, teacher in this regard for me, but Mm -hmm. is really that relationship between joy and pain and that, Mm -hmm. you know, it really is just about how open you are to life and to the world and that the deeper you are able to feel one, the deeper you will be able to feel the other. Right. And so in my life, my experience has been that actually my openness to experiencing pain has also increased my ability to experience joy. Um, So I no longer see those things as being in conflict with each other. You know what I mean? I do. I do. And I think that's really, I think it's a beautiful sentiment for you to share, you know, and I, you know, I'm still on the journey, I think, to really understand that. So that really sounds like the who you are, like the who you are is really, 
you know, that person that's modeling for us around joy and around joy and pain. I really appreciate you sharing that. That means a lot. So let's talk a little bit about the the what, you know, that you that you kind of put out there. You know, use the terminology activist. Mm-hmm. And you know, I really want to talk to you about that. You know, I, and I'll, I'm going to, you know, reflect a little bit by my own journey around that world, that word. Yeah. You know, I kind of came up in this work as an anti-racist organizer. And I remember we would pretty much say that we had moved from activism to organizing. And then, you know, thinking about anytime you put ism on the end of the word, it really becomes about like a, an ideology, a belief. Mm-hmm. So I'm just really thinking about as you make that identity of activist, and I'm thinking about if that would really be like an ideology of active or activating. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that, that particular identity looks like for you. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, when I was thinking about, I, I never quite felt we've done more than a couple takes of this, I will say, because of our technical, technological challenges. And I've never felt like I totally nailed the who am I question. So even the word activist, I mean, I used it because I think it is objectively accurate descriptor of what I've done for many years. But whether it's really, I, I don't know. I don't know that it goes much deeper than that. I mean, I think I'll say this. I am someone who, when I experience despair, when I experience pain, when I experience a feeling of hopelessness, I metabolize that through action. And so the way that I am able to cope with injustice in this world is by getting in community with others, is by yeah, taking action. And so that is a really important part of my process. And in that way, I feel like activism for me is sort of a a kind of medicine, you know, almost more maybe than it is a contribution. You know, it is a way that I process pain and it keeps me out of isolation and it keeps me in connection and it keeps me in community, you know? So for me, it's, it's kind of a catharsis, I guess. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you've also been a paid activist too, right? And I mean, a volunteer activist and a paid activist. And that's been, that's been a big part of other aspects of your identity too, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, a big part of my, a big part of myself as well is like kind of around a defining feature of my work has been Mm -hmm. community care, right? And figuring out how communities who are often not cared for you know, by mainstream society, how we can care for one another. And so for about a decade, I, I ran an organization that was by and for the sex worker community called St. James Infirmary. Um, it was a, a healthcare clinic and a social service agency where I started out as a client receiving services there and eventually became the executive director. And it was really this model of like, we're going to figure out how to, how to do for ourselves what you know, the medical system is not doing for us, right? How to care for one another. I'm also very involved with an organization called the Transgender, Gender Variant and Intersex Justice Project, which is um, an organization by and for Black trans women who have been formerly or are currently incarcerated or institutionalized. And so that's another organization where it's like communities figuring out how to care for themselves in the absence of the system doing so. And so those models, like alternative models of of community care and resilience and strength has also been something that I, you know, have a lot of kind of heart passion for. Mm, That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I really love what you said about when the systems and the institutions couldn't provide for you and your community that you realized you had to create and do for yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk a lot about creating, right? Creating yeah. instead of fighting. So if you could speak to that for a minute, I, I would really like to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say like as a queer woman, I do sort of feel like, I don't know, I, I really took the the lessons of the AIDS epidemic as kind of a a story that I feel like I inherited and, you know, that I was really shaped by learning about that history. And I was born in 1985, which is the year that HIV testing became available. And actually one of the first things I, first jobs I had was as an HIV test counselor. But, you know, and that was an example of a moment when the government, you know, I mean, many doctors were unwilling to see people with HIV, you know, there, they were, there was a real kind of pariah 
um, situation happening. And it was a lot of lesbians and queer women that rallied around and took care of, you know, their gay siblings. And I was really inspired by that. And I really felt like that was kind of part of my heritage as a queer person. And so, you know, just have always sort of carried that with me. And I think, yeah, it is about creating, you know, you fight against you fight against injustice. And at the same time, you create the world that you want to see. And St. James, which was this sex worker healthcare clinic to me was so exciting because it was this thing that no one thought would be possible, right? Like you're going to have a bunch of like, you know, strippers and sex workers, like, you know, Mm. providing medical services to each other. Like what? That sounds Mm. absurd, you know? And, and because it had never been done and because it was so, outside the parameters of, you know, what you would think is possible, we really got to kind of start from scratch and be like, well, how do we want to respond to this situation? What would healthcare look like if we were creating it? Oh, well, hormones for, you know, our trans siblings would need to be a part of it. Needle exchange would need to be a part of it. Strippers wear those high heels all day. We need to have chiropractic services be a part of it. You know, we just got to create, well, how do we want to respond when someone, you know, does harm at the clinic, right? Like we didn't have a rule book that we had to play out of. And so we got to create what we wanted. And that was really exciting and really beautiful. Now, the flip side of that is we are also working through a lot of trauma and Mm -hmm. um, we were immediately going from, I'll speak for myself. I was immediately going from having experienced trauma to trying to help other people heal from their trauma. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think a lot of us reproduced our trauma onto each other. And um, that was a real a real struggle with that organization. So after a decade there, it became clear to me that I actually had to focus on my own healing because if I didn't, I was just going to be recreating it in my communities. And I wanted to see a different reality and future for all of us. Nice. You know, I so appreciate what you're saying, really, because, you know, I think you're reflecting exactly the transition we're making in the movement to end racism. So, you know, going, getting away from just the anti-racist identity of just fighting against and saying, just identifying over and over again, everything that's wrong with the systems and institutions and creating with each other something new. And I also really appreciate because I think what we've experienced to this point is that if we're not healing our trauma, that we are continuing to play out our trauma on each other or on ourselves first and then on each other. So I think it's a great blueprint for exactly what we're trying to do as Soul Focus Group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it really is, I think, the the next level of work that I saw for myself. And, you know, for a long time, and I hear this come up in Soul Focus Group trainings a lot, you know, you hear white people saying, oh, well, I just don't feel like I... I I should have the right to heal or, you know, oh, it feels selfish to think about my own healing. And that is so, I get it. I get where, where people come from because I think I use that, to be honest, it was an excuse for me not to do my own work for a long time. I, I said probably similar things and then eventually realized like, if I'm showing up and doing this work as a way to distract myself from doing my own work, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not really showing up authentically, you know, for my community. And there was a lot of ways in which I could say, oh, well, I don't have time to go to therapy, or I don't have time to look at my own trauma, because, you know, there's other people with more important, urgent trauma. And that might be true, right, in some sense. And also like by not processing my trauma, I wasn't really showing up authentically for the work. And now that I, first of all, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. So it was beautiful to learn. You can actually work on your own healing and continue to show up for others. And in fact, the way in which you show up for others will will be better by it, right? By doing that work. But yeah, also that there's a real cost to not doing that work. And I think people who loved me and cared about me in my community saw that I wasn't doing that work and were kind of like, mm, Steph Joy, <laughs> you got to work on that. <clears throat> you know, it's coming out your ear. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So many times people see it in us before we see it in ourselves. Right. Yep, and, yep. Uh, 
And as long as that's done with love, I think, unfortunately, a lot of what I've seen is that that pointing out is often done from a place of retribution or righteous anger, and it mm-hmm. doesn't have the same impact. Sounds like it was done with love for mm-hmm. you, that the people pointing that out to you had love for you. Can you talk a little bit more? Again, this is this is the whatever number of time you and I have done this. So I, I really want to want to hear and want you to share with our listeners how race and racism starts to become more prevalent in your journey around, you know, the community care and the helping and the, you know, the mutual, you know, the mutual support for people, you know, coming out of uh, of homelessness and people who are in the sex working field and and trans and, and queer folks. How does race and racism start to really, you know, come up for you in this work and yeah. become a primary focus of your work? Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, it's always been there. And I think I was reticent to name it and reticent Mm -hmm. to, to put my focus on it up until more recently. Right. And so I've shared with you, I was politicized around the ways in which I had experienced oppression. Right. So I sort of shaped my politics around my queerness, you know, being a woman, being working class. And I kind of formed this politic around the ways in which I had experienced marginalization, right? And all through my work in community, like racism has been a driving factor. It has permeated every single, you know, issue that I have been ostensibly working on, right? So, I mean, you can't really talk about you know, poverty without talking about racism. You can't really talk about the LGBT movement without talking about racism. You can't really talk about the struggles that sex workers are experiencing without talking about racism, certainly not, you know, incarceration or homelessness. But I think I was hesitant to do that partly because I didn't know where I as a white person fit into that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And, right? And also just because You know, I've shared with you, if I'm being totally honest, I think there was a righteousness and a sort of intoxicating, like moral superiority, moral superiority that I got to have when I was speaking from my places of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, or from, or from victimhood, right? And that fueled a lot of my early activism. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful that I feel like I'm growing out of that because when I started to get into healing work and, you know, through recovery work, I started to also be able to see how my power and my privilege as a cis person, certainly as a white person, as a person with relative economic advantage, the ways in which as an able-bodied person and a person who, you know, um, doesn't struggle with mental illness in certain ways. Like I started to see all the the ways in which that was also playing into my, my politics and just my existence in the world. And I started to be willing to look at that more closely. And mm-hmm. I'm so grateful that that's the part of the journey that I'm on because it feels like I'm finally able to hold who I am more holistically and mm. and just feel like I'm kind of more in in right relationship with my I don't know my place you know <laughs> and what I'm here to do in the world but yeah it did I did have to sort of like break up with some of that righteousness self righteousness that I think was infused my earlier activism. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because you know I was listening to you. Uh, say, you know, well, you can't, you know, you can't work on gender issues without racism and you can't work on class issues without racism. You can't work on LGBTQ racism, LGBTQ plus issues without racism. And my first thought was, well, people should try. You can. Yeah, you (laughs) can, but you're not going to. People should try every day. And I think they're pretty successful at at trying, you know, at doing it. So I appreciate that you, you know, you saying that, that how that journey looked for you, because there's certainly a default you know, at the very beginning of our of our podcast today, you said, well, you know, you have a hard time nailing that who you are and what you are question. And as soon as you said that, I'm like, it just makes me think about because I think you, you I think you nailed it every time. And I, it just makes me think about how how prominent ego is in this, how yeah. prominent self, false self is yeah. and how prominent, 
the idea of measuring ourselves through other people in other ways. And it just really sounds like so much of your journey has been to do all of your work, your activist work, your, you know, I, I don't know much about your artistic work. My guess is your artistic work probably takes you out of ego as much as possible because that's a lot of people's artistic work. But it really seems like that's a huge part of your journey and why, you know, your connecting with Soul Focus Group comes at such a opportune and really perfect time for you because you're already on this journey out of ego and into what we call soul or, you know, being soul focused. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to go back to your point about, you know, people working on issues without racism in the, in the analysis, because when I think about actually what my, what my sort of life's work journey has looked like, it was like, okay, I was like, I'm going to work on HIV. Right. And then I, I went to the, the Tenderloin AIDS Resource Center and was like, oh, HIV is just actually homelessness is the thing that's happening here that's more pressing for people than HIV. And then it was like, oh, well, actually underneath homelessness is racism, right? And as you start to get deeper into any of these issues, you see that like at the core of it, there's mm-hmm. like a disconnect from our own humanity that right. has allowed us to disassociate from the suffering of other people, which is also the suffering of ourselves, right? And, and that's really what's upholding all of this. And racism right. is like one of the primary operatives of that, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And so to me, you know, you we talk about radical and, you know, being, meaning getting at the root of something. And it's like, that's the root. That's what the journey of my work has been is it's like getting deeper and deeper and deeper and like, okay, what's actually at the root of all of this, you know, Mm -hmm. because at the root of the struggle for sex workers rights, at the roots of the struggle for economic justice, at the roots of, you know, ending homelessness is, you know, this kind of spiritual malady that is racism, right? And Mm -hmm. that is just basically our inability to connect to one another's humanity and thereby connect to our own humanity. And so I'm so grateful that that's where this work with Soul Focus Group is taking me. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about alignment, right? There's nothing forced about it. Like, you know, you, you know, Dustin met you at a time when you were, I think you were asking the universe, right? Like you were like begging the universe, like I really want to continue to take this work to an even higher and higher level around race and racism. And then that's when Dustin meets you. And that's when, you know, he connects and sees, you know, something. And I give him a lot of, a lot of credit that, you know, without a lot of interaction and just virtual interaction, that he was able to see in you uh, that alignment and how, you know, positive you would be for our organization, for Soul Focus Group. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because one of the things around homelessness is I'm like, we, we can end homelessness. Like homelessness is a solvable problem. It's not, we're not trying to cure cancer. You know, it, it's literally housing. <laughs> you give someone a home and they are no longer homeless. Right? right. So, and sometimes, you know, you gotta provide some support services or make, make the space accessible, but like there is a solution to that. We can solve that. Right. And so I don't actually believe that homelessness just exists because, you know, there's not enough housing or there's not enough resources. Like I live in the wealthiest city in the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country in the world. It's absurd to me that we think we can't solve homelessness. Right. But until we can no longer walk down the street and, you know, walk by someone's grandmother, you know, who's, who's sleeping outside until we can no longer like until we can repair whatever allows us to disassociate from that suffering. Right. And like Mm -hmm. I said, racism is an agent of that disassociation, that disconnection. We're not, we're not going to solve it. And so that, that's where I feel like I was starting to realize that. And then um, I met Dustin and was all the conversations we were having. I was just like, yep, this is the work. This is the conversation. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it's the other thing that I really feel from you is, you know, your alignment with our return to to human solidarity, you know, that that all of these things that have been set up to divide 
and I really believe from other conversations that I've had with you and other conversations we'll, you know, we'll share in the future with future podcasts that, you know, you also understand that there's also a lot of division in the sort of left or, you know, the progressive the activist, the organizing community that, you know, the anti-racist, the, you know, the, the community around homelessness, that there is, there's so much divide that, that we perpetuate because we still um, have that fighting energy and not enough of that creating energy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I love when you and I talk about the ways in which our identities can be used to, you know, ideally we would, our experiences of trauma, our experiences of harm, our experiences of oppression or marginalization, Mm -hmm. ideally we would be able to use those as connective tissue, (laughs) you know, to bring, to bring us closer to one another. And unfortunately, a lot of, I think, you know, the culture of whiteness in particular has created this, what you, you've talked about is like the objectification of identities where instead what they're doing is splintering us and actually creating more of an individualistic framework. And that's like the opposite direction I think we're trying to go. And I see that in, you know, white queer community all the time. And it's something that I'm really doing a lot of a lot of healing around as well because I want my like I said I want my experiences to connect me to more people rather than separate me or make me think that my suffering makes me unique. My suffering is my own experience that I have been given to live through and to sort through, but it doesn't make me unique it, it's actually part of the fabric of this experience that connects us all mm-hmm. yeah thank you uh, that's so true i think it's a great a great place for us to end this first episode because to me it comes full circle with you identifying yourself that the, the real who you are is steph joy and that the way that you talked about joy and pain and not seeing them as exclusive or opposites or in that in that white culture you know dichotomous either or you're either in joy or you're in pain i like that you Made that connection and, and then you know where you ended what you just were saying around suffering and um, how that that should never be a way that we disconnect ourselves from other people yeah. and instead that we also hold you know that it's connected to joy and that we can be connected to other to all other human beings even if we look at them and don't feel like their experience is exactly the same as ours knowing that they have also suffered and they've also felt joy yeah Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll let our listeners know that you're going to hear more from Steph Joy in the very near future. One way or another, we're going to have more conversations with each other that, that we will have on the podcast. And, you know, we just want to thank everybody for always coming on this journey with us. And we hope you heard something today that resonated with you on your own journey. We hope today that you felt a connection with what Steph Joy and I talked about and that you see that this is all about us finding what we have in common with each other, um, returning to solidarity with ourselves and each other and, you know, uniting for, for real change and know, know that we love you. And we're so excited to have you on this journey with us. Please check out all of our podcasts on the Apple podcast platform, the Android podcast platform, soon coming to Amazon podcast check out our YouTube. We're adding a lot more content to our YouTube channel, Soul Focus Group. So, and come to soulfocusgroup.com, soulfocusgroup.com, our ever growing and improving and changing website. So again, uh, we, we thank you so much. We ask you to stay safe, stay well, uh, and all that that means in this world right now. And most of all, we ask you, along with all of us, to stay soul If you wish to support and represent the Soul Focus Group, check out our apparel store at our website, www.soulfocusgroup.com forward slash shop.